back a year ago. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Beer Bound Podcast. In today's episode, we're throwing everyone a little bit of a curveball. Suffice to say that with most of our guests on the podcast, we showcase beer in an overall positive light, often connecting this multi hoppy beverage with interesting people's stories and international topics. But let's be honest, beer contains a controversial ingredient that occupies a complicated facet of many, if not all, societies in the world. This, of course, being alcohol. Today we're joined by William Porter, author of Alcohol Explained, Understand Why You Drink Alcohol and How to Stop, and Alcohol Explained 2, Tools for a Stronger Sobriety. Let's learn a little bit more about our guest. Early in his professional life, William joined the 4th Reserve Battalion of the Parachute Regiment serving a six-month tour in Iraq. Upon his return to the UK, William worked as a paralegal and eventually obtained his qualifications to become a lawyer. Apart from his responsibilities as a writer, a husband, and a father, William currently works in the financial services sector of the City of London. So this begs the question, why write these two texts? William has a tumultuous history with alcohol. He started drinking when he was around 14 years old. Over the years, his drinking steadily increased, but he continued to take a common sense analysis of what it was doing to him, coupled with a technical analysis of the chemical, physiological, and psychological factors at play. William's drinking continued to increase until February 2014, when he finally stopped for good. So we're excited to speak to William and learn more about his personal journey with becoming sober, as well as the deeper context of his two books. So what, William, welcome to the Beer Bound Podcast. How are you doing? I'm very good. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I gave a pretty uh, overarching little intro about you, but I'm sure I missed lots, lots and lots of stuff. So maybe I'll pass the floor to you for a few more minutes. You could talk about your, maybe give us a bit more extended context of your history with alcohol, as well as a little bit more about who you are. Yeah, absolutely. What you did was very good and like the, the overarching kind of history of my life. But yeah, so the, the drinking is obviously what we're here to talk about. And that for me, so I started when I was about 14 um, and it was friends going out drinking. You know, I'm not sure what things are like over there, but certainly being 46 now, back in the, um, when would it have been like late 80s, early 90s, you were supposed to be 18 to buy alcohol, but it it wasn't a hard and fast rule. You could always find places to buy drink. Um, So we'd just go out and get drunk. And it was always, the goal was always to get drunk. I never really understood people having one or two so we were always out drinking a lot but to be fair it was kind of par for the course it's what everyone did Um, and I never got into the habit even in my later drinking years of drinking every day I was only ever a weekend drinker but what I was drinking was getting more and more and more Um, and it was wiping me out more and more and more and I suppose you know it's easy to look at certain things and pinpoint them for what is, I suppose, overall a steady decline. But one of the big things for me is what I found whenever I drank alcohol, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and not be able to get back to sleep. Um, And I remember reading a book, I think it was a Stephen King book, and one of the characters in there, he sits down and gets a crate of beer to watch his baseball game, but he always keeps a couple of beers back for the middle of the night to get him back to sleep. So I thought, oh, I'll try that. And it works really well, (laughs) but it blurs that line between not drinking and drinking so you know towards the end my weekends would look like I'd start drinking Friday lunchtime I'd drink right through into the evening I'd go to bed I'd wake up three or four in the morning and drink again and go back to sleep and then you know when you've already been drinking in the night it's quite a short step then to wake up in the morning and carry on drinking so I'd literally be drinking for the whole weekend and then of course Monday morning comes and you're an absolute bit so you ring in sick and then there's nothing much to do apart from start drinking again So it was getting more and more unwieldy. And as you say, in 2014, you know, the wheels came off quite badly. And it was, I can't keep doing this. This is just too much. So I stopped. Um, And then after that, wrote Alcohol Explained, started to piece things together a bit more. And it's sort of the whole sobriety thing has taken off from there, really. Did you quit cold turkey? I did. Yeah, I was in quite a bad way. But to be fair, I was, as I say, I wasn't drinking every day. Um, so it wasn't 
probably as dangerous as it might sound. Mm. Um, plus, I was in my late 30s at the time, which I think has a difference as well. So, no, I just quit completely and that was it. Would you say, William, that you said you started drinking when you were 14 years old and then you finally came to a conclusion in your mid to late 30s that enough is enough? Would you say that your whole pathway of being an alcohol consumer, was that pretty consistent from your adolescent period up until your mid thirties, or were there different periods of higher degrees of alcohol consumption? Maybe your military service was that maybe a period where you consumed less, maybe more. How would you sort of summarize your the entire path of your alcoholic journey? Really good question because joining the parachute regiment, obviously, it's airborne forces, so it's an elite force. So there's a very stringent test that you have to go through. So when I joined the parachute regiment, for example, I quit drinking completely for three months leading up to what was it's called P Company pre-parachute selection. That's the selection criteria for British Airborne Forces. Um, so I stopped completely, then went back into it. When I went out to Iraq, um, it was completely dry out there. So the six months out there, I wasn't drinking at all. But when I came back, I had two months decompression leave. So I had literally two months on full army pay to be doing whatever I liked. So I was drinking virtually every day. So it did ebb and flow a bit. But after that, when I got back to work, I went back to my weekend drinking. So that was kind of the default position for me. I mean, overall, I was drinking more and more as my tolerance went up, which I think is true for pretty much everyone. Um, and although there were periods of drinking all the time, for example, when I went on holiday with vacation for two weeks, I'd be drinking every day. But I would always find when I got back to work, I would sort of go back to just weekend drinking. One of the things being a lawyer, I found out very early on, I couldn't do my job properly when I was drinking. I needed a couple of days to get over it, to get to back to sleeping properly, to wake up feeling good, to do my job properly, because to sit there and really concentrate on stuff, you, you can't really do it. Well, I certainly, I couldn't really do it when I'd been drinking. So that to a degree kept me on the straight and narrow slightly. That makes sense. And William, what were you drinking in the 20 odd years that you were consuming alcohol? What was your drink of choice? So beer was my drink of choice, um, probably lager. So, um, but then what I would find is, to be honest, I would drink anything because I was drinking primarily for effect. And I honestly didn't particularly like the taste of any alcoholic drinks, although beer is more palatable than wine or spirits. But what I would find is as I was drinking more, I found it harder to drink enough beer, if that makes sense. There's a there's a thing over here called camera. It's a campaign for real ale. So it's like a it's a pressure group to try and get people to drink more ale as opposed to lager. Um, and they do a, a beer festival each year. So you sort of rock up on a Saturday at midday and spend all day sampling all different types of beers. And what I would find is after five or six pints, I could <laughs> I couldn't drink anymore. It was starting to make me feel a bit sick, but I still wanted to keep drinking. So I'd then move on to spirits or whatever. And I found that was true of most of my friends, to be honest. We'd go out and start on beer and then sort of progress on to stronger drinks as the evening wore on. I've seen that trend before. Usually it doesn't end up yeah. too well, depending on how fast and quick you go. But I've seen that trend. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah personally. Right, Gary? <laughs> so I was just going to say, see the trend. We didn't have to throw in personally. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I, didn't, I that was a question. cards on the table. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, William, you said, and we don't have to get into this if you don't want to, but you said in 2014 something happened that sort of you hit your rock bottom. Do you mind touching on exactly what that inc yeah, yeah, incident absolutely. was? Absolutely. So it was, I, I'd been through a couple of phases of stopping and then starting again because I was a stop starter anyway, being a binge drinker. Um, and I was drinking at the time, but I hadn't drunk. And I went out and I think it was a Tuesday or Wednesday I went out for a business lunch and so obviously was drinking, got back home and continued drinking. And then to be honest, I don't really remember much of anything. I must have woken up in the night and carried on, you know, the pattern I was just talking about. But by the time I got to the end of the week, I remember, I mean, this is what I was saying when the wheels came off quite bad. I remember at one point waking up in the middle of the night um, and this was very common when I was drinking, I would wake up knowing that I'd had an argument with my wife and she was deeply angry with me but having no memory of what the argument was about um 
So one of the things when people are asleep, if they are asleep, you can usually hear them breathing because they relax and their breathing becomes slightly louder. If people are completely silent, it usually means they're awake. So I woke up in bed, or I say woke up, like came to is a bit more accurate. And it was deadly silent in the room. And I thought, okay, my wife's lying there awake in the middle of the night, which means she's absolutely furious. So I didn't want to move because I knew it would start like the whole recriminations and argument again. So I was there for as long as I can. Eventually I had to go to the toilet. So I got up and as I got up and saw the room a bit clearer and, you know, the moonlight coming through the blinds, I realized the room was empty. And as I walked through to the toilet, the spare room where my two sons were sleeping was empty as well. And and my wife had left. I had no memory of how or why. Um, I just woke up and plonked myself on the sofa and just kept drinking again. So it was, it was it at its kind of lowest ebb. Um, and then I think I crawled out the end of that on a sort of a Saturday afternoon, feeling, as you can imagine, very, very bad. Didn't manage to sleep at all that night. Managed to get a bit of sleep over, over the ensuing nights and sort of clawed my way back from there, really. Right. So that led you to the decision that this can't even be a thing that you indulge in once in a while. It has to be 100% cold turkey. Yeah, it was, I, I was never, so I, I had tried on occasion. And when I say on occasion, out of a 25 year drinking cycle, I maybe tried it three or four times, but to have one or two drinks. And the reason I, I only tried it one or two times is because I didn't like having one or two drinks. I was all right not drinking. There were numerous occasions where I'd go out and wouldn't drink. And I always used to say to people, my preference is to go out and drink as much as I like, to not drink, or to have one or two. Having one or two for me was worse than not drinking. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't bother with it. And as I say, my experience of it was I don't really enjoy it. You know, I enjoy having the one or two drinks, but they go far too quickly. And then you're sat there wanting more and you can't have them. Whereas if you go out knowing you're not going to drink, it's a slightly different mindset. And right. it's easier to get through the evening. So at that point, I kind of knew that I would rather not drink than try and moderate or be sensible with it. Because having tried it, it just wasn't something I was interested in. Too much of a slippery slope, I suppose. Uh, having with the one or two and, you know, I guess maybe that at that point in time, like you were saying before, it's more just the urge to, to drink out, go and get drunk, I suppose. Yeah, I think so. It was also, it was... I found the effect of one or two was not a particularly pleasant effect. And I think, again, this comes down to tolerance. You know, in your early years, you might have one or two and it's, yeah, it's all good fun and brilliant. But you fast forward a few years and as your tolerance goes up, it doesn't really hit the spot anymore. So, William, take us from 2014 up into when you published your first text pertaining to alcohol because i know you do also have a book that pertains to cigarettes i believe correct yes I, yeah, I do it, if we have time for that we'll get into that but but from your your text your first from your first book from 2014 to your first book what was that pathway like what inspired you to to think that you needed to help individuals or to to have the cathartic experience of getting all of your thoughts out into a text also, can you talk a little bit about how you became so knowledgeable? I read quite a bit of this book and a lot yeah. of it is you seem like an expert on the topic. How did you come <laughs> to be so proficient in how alcohol works, what it does to us? Can you take us through this process? Yeah, absolutely. So I um, if you, I don't know if you've heard of a chap called Alan Carr, but if you Google or look on Amazon for books to stop smoking, they're virtually all by Alan Carr. He came up with a stop smoking method back in the 80s. And I read his book quite early on. I think I was sort of in my late teens, I think 15 or 16 when I first read it. And he took a really practical, and pragmatic approach to smoking. And it really fascinated me. And I think what I did after that was continue drinking but take that very practical and analytical approach when I was doing it, particularly in my later years, because when I was drinking, I was always, I was always happy drinking on my own. I was always happy just sitting on the sofa drinking, but I would be thinking about, well, hang on, why are you doing this? What is it doing for you? How does it make you feel? What would, how would you feel if you stopped now? How would you, how does it make you feel to have another one? What is it that's driving you to have that next one coupled with, 
basic science about what alcohol is and how it works on us to kind of come up with a different, I suppose, idea of what alcohol is. Because in this society, we do tend to put alcohol on a pedestal a bit. You know, we see all the positives and not many of the negatives. Um, and what I was piecing together, I suppose, was a very different drug to what society as a whole perceives it to be. Now, when I was looking to stop and before I'd stopped, I'd done a couple of stints at AA, which I suppose is a whole separate topic. But I didn't find it. I found the camaraderie very useful and the reaching out to people. But the 12 steps, I didn't quite understand how or why they could help. And I'm someone who likes if someone tells me to do something, I'll do it, providing there's a reason for it. I struggle with just doing things blindly. Um, and I always struggled a bit with the 12 steps. But to put that to one side, what I found at AA meetings is a lot of the time when people first arrived, they had questions, you know, like, why me? Why is this happening to me? Why can they drink normally and I can't? What's what's going on? And I realized that I cobbled together already quite a lot of the whys and hows. Um, and it helped me quit. Now, to go back to your original question of, you know, like the first year between quitting and writing Alcohol Explained, I started off with knowing that I could quit, partly because of my understanding of alcohol and how it worked. But I think what happened during that first year was quite interesting because my mindset when I quit in 2014 was... I can't keep doing this and the easiest way out is to just quit entirely but equally vacations I enjoy them when I can drink and I'm not expecting to go on vacation again and enjoy it ditto mm -hmm. Christmas and nights out with friends and all these different situations where you think you know what it's never going to be quite the same without a drink whereas I think what that first year taught me after a lot of trial and error was actually of course you can enjoy yourself without alcohol you can enjoy nights out with your mates you can enjoy vacations holidays christmas all of it because you did before you started drinking you know when we're kids you don't sit there on holiday miserable because you can't have a drink you just enjoy yourself you know when you see toddlers you know 10 11 12 years old enjoying themselves at a party they're not sat there miserable because they can't have a drink. It's only when we introduce this drug in the first place that we suddenly lose the ability to enjoy ourselves without it. And I think when that kind of fell into place, I started to think this is knowledge and information I had that could potentially help people to quit, primarily because a lot of the reasons we drink alcohol, well, in fact, all the, let's be honest, the reasons we drink alcohol is for the benefits. You know, it to talk about beer because that's what you guys do it tastes good it makes you feel good in small quantities it's not only harmless but it's good for you etc 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 but hang on what if a lot of those are untrue then you're coming at it from a slightly different angle and it, it actually makes quitting a lot easier because if you change the alcohol whatever it is from something you want to something you know what i don't really want this anymore quitting isn't about resisting temptation it's about just making a decision to not drink anymore once you made up your mind in 2014 that was it you know didn't have any process of relapsing you were able to continue all the way through up until now or did you run into some speed bumps no i mean I, at the time i was in a bad way not only from the drinking but also you know as you could probably <laughs> gather from what I said, my, my marriage was not in a good place. I hated my job. I had two young children. I was struggling with the transition to fatherhood. Our house was far too small. It was small for two people, let alone four people, two of which are children, which need massive amounts of plastic toys and nappy changing paraphernalia and all the rest of it. So I was not in a particularly good place. Um, so it was a long procedure and quitting doesn't solve all of those problems frankly so it was a long process so alcohol explained your first book came out in what year 2015 so 2015 so that means you wrote this whole text you became quite an expert in a short amount of time and then i believe was it only a couple of years ago that you published the second one yeah i can't remember when that was now but yeah um, a few years ago <laughs> that's right 
Okay, so I liked your book because it it went over kind of, I liked it the way it was written too. And I think I read somewhere or heard you say somewhere that you wanted it to be an approachable text. It, it's not a scientific textbook by any means. It's kind of punchy. It's available and kind of open to lesser sophisticated readers such as myself. So I really like that. And you kind of go through a lot of different points going over how alcohol, what alcohol does to you. And then you sort of go through the the sort of process of what alcohol is. And then it kind of morphs into the process of quitting and, and what that's sort of like. So can you talk about your, the actual process of writing this book? Was this a difficult thing? I suspect it was. How long did it take you? Did you have to do a lot of research? Did you f- lean on different experts for the information that you used? It was a bit of a stop start process because I, sounds strange to say, but I didn't really want to write it. I'm not the most patient of people and I'm pretty good at writing short, sharp things and obviously being a lawyer. So what I write is short letters or emails and sitting down writing a book felt like a horribly long thing to do. Um, And so I kind of kept making excuses to not do it. But I think a few, it just became apparent that I did have information that could help people and it seemed wrong to not try at least to make something of it. Um, I rather arrogantly thought when I sat down to write the book that I had everything I needed. But actually, it's it's very funny because people often say, you know, if you want to know a subject, teach it. I would say if you want to know a subject, write about it. Because when, when I was writing it out, I started to realize that there were bits missing. There was a piece of the jigsaw I still hadn't quite filled in. So writing it was hugely beneficial for me anyway. But the most difficult part of writing it is breaking everything down into its constituent parts because the desire to drink is made up of lots and lots and lots of individual factors but we experience them all together um so trying to break it down and deal with it in an order is incredibly difficult because to a degree each part is reliant on other parts so it would it, it was a difficult thing just from a sort of stylistic perspective in just trying to get it all set out into logical components if you like logical chapters so william we we've spoken to quite a few historians that look at beer and its connection to us over maybe 4 to 6000 year period it's quite it's quite an associative part of our culture, specifically a European piece of European culture and post-colonial culture in North America and, and kind of spreading all over the world. Alcohol is so synonymous with most countries. And if you go back in time, you can kind of see, well, maybe, and we can stick with beer for a second, maybe the consumption of beer made sense. It was more utilitarian. You boil beer. So typically drinking beer, you you give it to children because it's a lot safer to drink beer than, than the drinking water and your nearby lake or river. And also beer is super caloric. So instead of taking the time to make and consume bread, you could just make and consume beer. Why not? But that kind of goes back to when we were in survival mode as civilizations and trying to sustain ourselves and keep just being hand to mouth and continue our, continuing our existence. Why do you think in the 21st century, when in a country like the UK or in Canada, we're such an affluent society, we don't need to drink anymore. You mentioned being a kid and going on vacation, you just had fun. You can have a lot of fun in as an adult by not drinking. Why do you think people drink? in the year 2023 i think it's cultural it's incredibly difficult i mean look at the the lesson of prohibition back in the 30s you can't legislate against something that 87 percent of the population do because people lose respect for the law and just keep doing it so i don't know if you've heard this but people have often said if alcohol was discovered now it would be a class a drug it would not be legal, but we're not in that position. We've grown up with it and our parents have grown up with it and our grandparents, and it's a massive part of our culture. It's a big part of our economy as well. You can't just ban it and throw everyone out of work. For sure. Um, so it's there and it always will be, but I think it it is going the way that smoking's going. I, I, I genuinely see it moving that way. If you look at, you know, there's so many reports out there of millennials shying away from alcohol. People are losing interest in it. They're starting to see it very differently. You know, I've heard many times about what you've said and, you know, people saying 
you know it's an important part of human development but I think one of the reasons it was so popular is it's easy to make you know we humans are pleasure seekers you know if we don't feel good we try and change that so that we do feel good Um, And an easy way, you know, if you've got bad feelings, if you take a sedative or an anaesthetic, you're going to dampen those feelings down and improve how you feel. You know, 100, 500, a few thousand years ago, people didn't have the chemicals to make cocaine or methamphetamine, but they had fruit and vegetables. And if you put a bit of yeast into it and leave it to rot for a bit, you create alcohol. So I think it was literally as easy as that. It was something that was easy to make. It was accessible to people and it changed changed how they felt, which is sometimes beneficial. So it just it just caught on from that. And it's now so intrinsically linked in society. Um, it, it's inconceivable to think how we did without it. One thing I would say, though, I don't think it's as linked to as many civilizations as you think i think about 50 percent of the people on the planet don't drink so if you think there's about eight billion people on the planet about four billion billion of them don't drink obviously there's religious reasons there's a lot of cultural reasons as well a lot of countries it's not against their religion but it's just culturally not the done thing you know a lot of poorer countries just can't afford it you know if they've got fruit or vegetables they eat it rather than let it rot and create a drug out of it you talk a lot, you start your book talking about what alcohol does to our body, which, to be honest, scared me a little bit. I, It's not exactly new, like I kind of knew a lot of this information already, but you kind of pinpoint exactly what it does, particularly to our mental state and our, I know you go quite further into detail in your book, but could you talk about what exactly alcohol does to our body, to the biology of a human being? Yeah, absolutely. And this is, I suppose, the crux of it, really. Um, So alcohol is a sedative. It's a depressant. And when I use the word depressant, I'm using it in its chemical sense as something that depresses or inhibits nerve activity. Okay, that's why when you drink, you tend to feel slightly more relaxed. And I was talking about it being an anesthetic. Um, That's fairly standard stuff. But I think where it gets more interesting is when we look at the human brain. Because the human brain creates and excretes a huge array of chemicals, drugs and hormones. So it actually makes these things and puts them in our system to change how we feel and to allow us to function. So a lot of these, you know, you will have heard of like adrenaline and endorphins and dopamine and all of this stuff. It's stuff your brain creates and excretes. Now, as humans, there's a massive amount we don't know about this process. But what we do know is the brain works by way of something called homeostasis which is, in essence, a balance of all these chemical drugs and hormones. So it tries to maintain this balance. Now, when you take alcohol, which is a sedative, your brain reacts to it, and it reacts in lots and lots of different ways. But one of the ways is to release stimulants like adrenaline and cortisol, which is a stress hormone, to try and counter the sedating effects of the alcohol. Okay, so when the alcohol wears off, there's that period of anxiety or you know feeling slightly on edge, which is the counterbalance. So, so the way I sometimes explain it is imagine you're in a vehicle and it's a completely clear sunny day and you're on a nice straight flat road and you're trying to go at 30 miles an hour. So your foot is pressed very specific amount of the accelerator and you don't need to move it. You're just going along at 30 miles an hour. If you suddenly hit a load of wet mud and you know it's raining really heavily the vehicle slows down it loses traction and slows down so you have to push harder on the accelerator to get up to 30 miles an hour okay if you then suddenly leave the wet mud behind and go back onto the dry concrete you fly ahead out of all control so that's basically what happens when you drink alcohol your brain tries to counter the sedating effects of the alcohol by becoming overly sensitive So when the alcohol wears off, there's a feeling of anxiety. So, you know, in essence, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So whatever relaxed sedating effect you get from alcohol leaves a corresponding feeling of anxiety when it wears off. Um, One of the most important points to note here is the brain becomes more proficient at countering the effects of the alcohol. So when you first drink, you can have one or two or three, and then you'll be really drunk and maybe throwing up 20 years down the line. You know, you could have four or five times that amount quite comfortably. What's changed there is your brain's ability to counter the sedating effects of the alcohol. The reason that can be a problem 
is several fold. First, you need to drink more to get the same effect. But secondly, and most importantly, that anxious feeling gets worse because the more you're drinking, the more your brain has to readjust to counter the alcohol and the worse you feel when it wears off. And that's what anxiety is. You know, that colloquial term for feeling anxious a night after drinking, that's the chemical explanation for it. And I guess maybe to that to that point, there's obviously varying extremes there. And I'm sure you have a take on like, you know, how that affects that it seems like obviously that's a little bit more short term. Obviously, uh, tolerance will take a while. But I mean, in the long term effects of that, of that happening, let's say over and over again, to your point, you know, every single weekend, um, you know, do you touch on anything with a longer term effect with that regard physiologically? Is there anything maybe in your own experience or something that you've researched that was like sort of like a big, I don't know, maybe like an aha uh, take moment. Well, I think one of the biggest parts of that. So, so that if you imagine that process increasing steadily as time goes by, um, one of the most important things to know is it, it, it isn't a pleasant feeling. Okay, there's two ways you can get rid of that unpleasant feeling. One is to wait a few hours, a few days for the brain chemistry to get back to normal. But a far quicker way of getting rid of that unpleasant feeling is to have another drink. Because the reason you're feeling unpleasant is the brain's geared up to work under the sedating effects of the alcohol, but the alcohol's not there. So if you introduce another drink, you immediately feel better. There's a few points to note from this. One of them is that that's the main benefit regular drinkers get from their daily drinks. That's the lovely relaxed feeling they get from their drinks. It's no more than anesthetizing an unpleasant feeling that alcohol caused in the first place. But what's worse in a way is the subconscious which is a part of your brain that automates reactions to things so i don't know if you guys drive i presume you do but if you drive and you're sat in a vehicle as a passenger and the driver's driving too fast or too close to the vehicle in front you find your leg keeps tensing as if you're trying to press the mm. brake air braking right. that's your subconscious you're not born with that no one's born with that they learn it and what your subconscious is doing it absorbs that Whenever you're going too fast or too close to the vehicle in front, you tense your right leg and the vehicle slows down. The subconscious misses out on the fact that you haven't got like a brake under your right foot, so it's pointless and just triggers the reaction. Now, what your subconscious starts to do, it starts to notice this unpleasant feeling and it starts to notice that another drink will get rid of it. And as you repeat that over and over again, the subconscious work learns by repetition. So as you do that over and over again, what you actually do is create the desire for the next drink as the previous one wears off because you have a drink, your brain recalibrates, the alcohol wears off and you start to feel a bit tense and a bit unpleasant and your subconscious interprets that as I want another drink. You, do you guys ever hear people say I don't have an off switch? Yeah, okay, that's, okay. Yep. that's what happens when you don't have an off switch. When you've been drinking long enough that your your subconscious makes that jump, that's what it means to not have an off switch. It means mm. that your subconscious triggers the desire for it. It doesn't matter whether you have one drink, 10 drinks, 20 drinks. When they start to wear off, that makes you want another one. You mentioned a lot about what it does to the subconscious of a human, which I think is very <laughs> relevant. You also talk about just general memory as well. So you obviously, your rock bottom moment, you when you came to, you couldn't even really remember what was going on, why you were alone in your house. So can you talk about, William, what exactly does alcohol do to our our memory, our short-term memory specifically? Why does it eliminate, why does it make individuals unable to recall recent pasts that they've had? Why does it blur our short-term memory? Alcohol doesn't just make us feel relaxed, it anesthetizes and it intoxicates. And it has a particularly intoxicating effect on a part of the brain called the limbic system. Okay, one of the jobs of the limbic system, this is all theoretical, by the way, we don't, we as humans don't know this, this is just what people have studied, and they've come up with theories. The theory is we have a short term and a long term memory. So like, for example, we three are sat here having a conversation, and we remember what we're talking about because otherwise we wouldn't be able to have a meaningful conversation. But in 20 years down the line, we probably won't remember. In fact, even in a month or so, we might have forgotten. So it's short-term memory stuff. But there's other memories that go into your short-term memory and then from there into your long-term memory. So the more important things transition from short-term memory to long-term memory. 
what the theory is, is that it's the limbic system that allows that processing to happen. So to take something from short term memory and put it into long term memory when you're drinking and it can either be drinking a lot on one occasion or drinking lots over a longer period of time, you can't lay memories down from short term to long term. So it interferes with your ability to make long-term memories, which is why when you're drinking, you can have blackouts. Now, when, when I talk about blackouts, what people normally think of is, oh, yeah, I went out, we drank, we did a load of shots, and I can't remember the evening. That's one aspect of it. But for the more serious problem drinkers, it's just a build up over time. So if you're drinking seven or eight drinks every day, you might not appear to be intoxicated but you'll have massive gaps in your memory because it's just a long ongoing process. It's funny when you bring that up, it sort of reminds me of, you know, I don't know people saying or joking about being a functional alcoholic, which, you know, from a physiological perspective is not true. Like if you have these gaps in your memory and you can't remember things, you can't function on your own, on your own without consuming alcohol. And I know I just find it to be a funny term. Um, but yeah, like these things are, you know, pretty plain as day when you experience them. And, and most people experience them when consuming alcohol in large quantities. I'm sure you've probably heard that term and I imagine you probably shake your head at it as well. Definitely can't be true. <laughs> <laughs> well, William, you also talk about, you have a, a chapter two about cravings, why individuals who consume and over consume alcohol have cravings towards alcohol. This concept of being addicted to alcohol. Can you touch that a little touch on this a little bit of why individuals have these urges if you're a if you're a binge drinker if you consume alcohol daily why do why do you have these psychological urges and cravings to go back to and drink more? This is what part of what I was talking about before is we experience everything as as one big glut almost but breaking it down into its individual parts is really important people often think of cravings as you know like a bolt of lightning that comes out of the sky there's nothing you can do about it a craving is a conscious thought process whereby we start fantasizing um, and idolizing something so we sit there and we just it's almost like obsessing with something you can't concentrate on anything you're just thinking about this one thing now it can feed into an addiction in numerous different ways. One of which is that it actually makes things worse because let me give you like a classic example, you know, with beer, with alcohol. Yeah, so okay. let's say you have a bad day at work and your, your go-to thing when you have a bad day at work is to go home and crack open a beer. So it's sit and help you relax or you're out with friends. Okay, so both of those situations, going home after a hard day at work or being out with friends should be inherently enjoyable okay if you get in the habit of having a beer when you do it and then you for whatever reason don't have a beer you haven't got any you've run out you can't get them or you're trying to stop you're doing dry january whatever it might be what can often happen is you come in from the bad day at work or you're out with your friends and instead of thinking oh i'm glad that day's over i can sit and relax now or ever thinking oh good i'm with my mates i can have a good chat and a laugh with them you're not concentrating on that you're thinking Oh, I can't have a drug, I wish I could have a drink, cold beer would be so nice. And, oh. and what you're doing, you're, you're suddenly taken up in this unpleasant internal tantrum. So you're in an inherently enjoyable situation. You're at home after a hard day at work. You're with your mates. Being on vacation, you know, you might be sat there out in a deck chair in the sun having a really nice time of it. But if you're not paying any attention to what's going on around you, if instead you're totally taken up with this unpleasant internal tantrum, you might as well be sat in a prison cell for, you know, for the pleasant situation you're in. So there's one easy way to get rid of that craving, that obsessive, obsessive thought, and that's to have a drink. Because if you have it, you're not going to sit there obsessing about it. So what people start to find is I don't enjoy myself when I'm not drinking. Um, and again, you know, we're all busy people we don't necessarily have time to drill in and analyze it. But our experiences, nights out are all right. But actually, if I really want to enjoy myself, I need an alcoholic drink. So the craving process really kind of feeds in to how we perceive alcohol, because we perceive it as the cherry on the cake with vacations and nights out with friends and all of these different things. 
But part of that is when we've introduced it into our lives, when we then try and do it without it, because we're not quite focusing on the event in question, instead we're obsessing about the fact we can and can't drink or should I, shouldn't I, it kind of distracts us from it. Um, and it's also interesting because we have a lot of very, I'll say arbitrary rules about when we can and can't drink. Okay. If you vape or you smoke, it's perfectly fine and even expected to wake up in the morning and hit the vape or have a cigarette. But if you wake up in the morning and start knocking back shots of tequila, you know, you've got a serious problem. Mm. So a lot of people, they might be drinking very heavily. They might be fully into the withdrawal, relieving the withdrawal process of the drug where they wake up feeling anxious and unpleasant and they have a drink to get rid of that feeling. But what they don't do is they don't crave because they wake up in the morning. They're not sat there thinking, oh, should I, shouldn't I have a drink? Because they don't drink in the morning. And that's so set in stone. They don't even go down that thought process. They just wake up. They're worried about getting a shower, getting to work, getting the kids ready, whatever it might be, and getting on with their day. And it's not until they hit the evening where they're allowed to drink and the thought enters their mind and it becomes a possibility that the craving really kicks in. So like almost setting you know, setting your mindset so that like if you do set up your brain in a way or set up your, let's say your mental schedule, it's almost like a way to maybe circumvent the craving. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's what you do when the thought, people often talk about triggers, what triggers you to have a drink. For me, the trigger isn't a problem. The trigger is just the thought of a drink entering your mind. It's what you do with that thought afterwards. You know, for me, I've made a decision. I don't like drinking anymore. And I don't want to do it. So I think about drinking an awful lot of my time, but I never sit there thinking about whether I will or won't have a drink. Mm -hmm. So I never crave alcohol. A big question, obviously, that folks will have, and you do address this in the text, like just the yeah. concept, you go over to the, the, this idea of why you have to go cold turkey fully, full sobriety is the best path. If you become a, a moderate drinker, whatever that could mean, if you only limit yourself to say three, maybe say three drinks a week or something like that, that's not the best path to go. Full sobriety is the best path to go. Why is that for you? Why do you see this as a sort of all or nothing game in which you really can't be half in the bag? You have to be one or the other. So for me, I don't necessarily see my remit as telling people that they should be all or nothing. Uh, for me, I, I kind of, I, I like to think I don't tell people they should or shouldn't drink or they should drink less or whatever. It's just to present almost like a different way of looking at alcohol. So you see it this way, but have you thought that it might not be that it might be something else. And if it's something else, is that something you want to make some different decisions around it? The reason I don't go much for moderation. And I certainly, if someone comes to me and says, I have a problem, what should I do? I never recommend moderation it is a few reasons. Firstly, I've already talked about when your subconscious makes that link between one drink wearing off and wanting another one. Okay. That's learned behavior and you can never unlearn that. So people often talk about having a reset. I'll quit for a month and then I can go back to drinking less it doesn't work that way. And it's the same for any addiction. When people start smoking or vaping, they may be able to have it just once a week when they're out with mates, whatever. When they start doing it all the time, they can never go back to that stage. There's a take it or leave it stage with every drug. OK, when you're through that take it or leave it stage, you can never return to it. Because the take it or leave it stage ends when the brain links the unpleasant feeling that kicks off when one dose of the drug wears off with the taking of the another. OK, you can stop drinking, smoking, vaping, whatever, for a week, a month, a year, a decade, 50 years. But as soon as you have that next dose, the brain will say, oh, I remember this unpleasant feeling and I know just how to get rid of it. I want another one. OK, so for people who have crossed that line, moderation is inherently difficult. That, that's point one. Point two, the reason I don't have to struggle with sobriety and I don't have to work at it and I don't have to do this, this and this to try and maintain it is because I don't want to drink anymore. And the reason I don't want to drink anymore is because I see alcohol differently. Like you guys still drink beer, right? So you're still happy mm -hmm. with what you're doing, all the rest of it. I've gone through a slightly different process because I've looked at it and said, okay, 
I need it. I have more fun out with my mates when I'm drinking. Do I really, or can I still enjoy myself without it? And I go through that. It helps me sleep. Does it really help me sleep or does it do the opposite? I've been through that whole process and I don't want it anymore. Okay. There's to me, there's two ways of quitting a drug. You can make a list of all the reasons you want to quit all the downsides to the drug and then sort of grit your teeth and try and resist the temptation or you can go at it a different way. You can make a list of all the reasons you want to carry on doing it and the reasons you don't want to quit. And then you can go through and jettison those. That's the method that I recommend because it works for me. And if you jettison every reason you want to keep doing something, you're not resisting temptation. You just don't want to do it. And that's why I'm confident I'm never going to drink again because I'm never tempted to do it. Now, mm. if you do go through that process why would you want to moderate? You see, I don't want to moderate because I don't want to drink in the same way. I don't want to hit myself on the knee with a hammer. I just mm -hmm. don't want to do it. And I wouldn't want to do it lots. And I wouldn't want to do it <laughs> once if you see what I mean. <laughs> so for people yeah. who have like, I've got a problem with alcohol, I want to moderate. To me, the mere fact they want to moderate suggests they've still got a problem because they still can't envisage living a happy and good life without this drug because that's what it comes down to it's the ability to live and enjoy your life without a drug okay if you can do that fully why would you want to be moderating it so the, the, the a jumble of answers there mm -hmm. but for various reasons particularly if people have crossed that line where it's becoming a problem it's inherently difficult for them to quit and although it seems counterintuitive it's easier to quit a drug than to try and moderate it because when you quit if you do it in the right way you make a decision to not drink again and you move on when you're moderating you're having to decide constantly so like for example i don't drink so i went out for our work christmas party last month okay and i went out for the party and I don't drink. So I didn't, I didn't waste any time thinking, oh, should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I? Mm. If I was moderating, I would have been, oh, I, I can have this one. And then I've got to wait half an hour for the next one. And then, or, or maybe I'll wait till tomorrow. And I'd be obsessing just as much about alcohol. It'd be dominating my life as much as it was when I was drinking in a different way. And I wouldn't be walking around absolutely hammered, but I'd still be constantly thinking about alcohol. The problem with moderation is... It's not what we expect it to be, because what you want of moderation is I have two or three beers. I'm happy with it and I'm done. But of course, that's not how it works. You have your two or three beers and you desperately want more and you spend the rest of the evening obsessing about it. Mm -hmm. So that's why I don't recommend it. But then having said that, people have read alcohol explained and moderated. And that's as I say, that that's entirely their decision. I, I kind of see my remit as here's information. Here's a new way of looking at things. But it's up to you the individual to take that information and say oh, i don't care i'm gonna keep drinking or okay i'm gonna do something about it i'm gonna cut back i'm gonna and, and as far as i'm concerned that's you know we're all grown up so it's your decision to make whatever choices you want and william how do you know if you have a problem what is the line that you would suggest individuals looking to or do you see that as sort of an individual's journey and it's up to individuals to decide or do you see this as a firm definition of if you reach this particular point, you have a problem? So I, th there's a few answers there. One, it is up to each individual. I don't think it's for anyone to say you've got a problem, you don't have a problem. Um, secondly, if you're even thinking about along those lines, it's a problem <laughs> because a problem is something that you're grappling with, you're thinking about, it's an issue. So if you're even thinking, is it a problem? You're thinking along those lines anyway. So the fact that you're there thinking, is this serving me as it should be is means it's a problem. And to put this into context as well, um, I've had a lady contact me who drinks a glass of red wine once or twice a week. Okay. She's clearly not on any kind of scale of alcohol dependency by anyone's standards, but she enjoys that glass of red wine. She finds it spoils her sleep. It's not doing her any favors, but she's struggling to kick it out. So for her, that is a problem. It wouldn't be a problem for the vast majority of people. So it's a very individual thing. But for, if you want a more specific answer, I would go back to that off switch that your brain interpreting that feeling of one drink wearing off 
to wanting another because for me if there's a physiological answer to that question it's at that point because that's where it's hard to say no and part of you may be saying you know what I don't want to get drunk tonight I make a fool of myself when I get drunk I've got to do x y and z in the morning but you still end up drunk and that's why you might pretend that's not a problem but it is a problem frankly because if you're having something and you're drinking more of it or consuming more of it than you want and it's wiping you out the next day then that is a problem the internal battle maybe of what you've determined in your head and then what actually happens uh yeah. what you have what you give into i guess that's you know, the struggle but, yeah, yeah and it's i think it's worse as well because you know when you're out with your friends and you've had a few drinks you don't care you care less and less about what's going to happen mm. the next day don't you so it just becomes increasingly easy to drink too much slippery slope what would you say to individuals say in the craft beer scene or maybe in the sophisticated quote unquote wine scene or individuals who like to explore different spirits say what would you say to individuals like this who view alcohol as i guess the the alcohol snobs if i can call them that of the world who find these sophisticated flavor notes and complexities in alcohol and like to experiment in that way and Maybe the alcohol is in kind of a lovely addition if people are wanting to get inebriated, but they see alcohol as a bit more of a, a spectrum in, in what it gives to them in a benevolent way. What would you say to individuals like that? It's, it's entirely up to them. I mean, as I say, I'm not here to dictate how people live their lives. It's to give information. And it's, you know, if there are such people listening, then maybe I've planted a seed and they'll be interested to rethink things. Maybe they won't be. But again, that's entirely their prerogative. Remember as well, you you know, you get cigar connoisseurs you used to get people smoking cigarettes and talking about flavors and different types of tobacco and all the rest of it. See it less and less these days. But you, you, you know, you used to get that, you know, where you have a drug and people consume it regularly, they'll comment on various aspects of it. Um, I dare say you've got people taking methamphetamines in various derelict buildings, maybe doing a similar thing. Or oh, this is better or worse than the last one we had. As I say, it's entirely up to each individual, I think. So, William, if someone reads your book or one of your books and decides for themselves that my situation my consumption of alcohol, it's maybe doesn't matter if it's a larger problem or a smaller problem. It's having malevolent consequences on your life in some capacity. At the end of Alcohol Explained, you kind of go through a few different chapters of a better way to quit. Can you kind of go over your concepts of if an individual reads your book, figures out for themselves, you know, sobriety is the pathway to a better me, a better life. What should that individual then do in their next steps to becoming sober? So for, for me, it's about changing the perception of what you're doing. And it's the same with nicotine, smoking, vaping. It's the same with drinking. It's changing your perception of it because there are different ways of perceiving it. So, you know, you've, you know, you talk to yourself now about, you know, the craft beers, people are putting a lot of time and effort into bespoke different bottles of beer wine flavors different spirits i mean you, you know you've got here scotland and all their different flavors around different single malts and all the rest of it um and there's that view of alcohol you know we've just had christmas as well and every picture of a christmas table has got bottles of red wine on it and all the rest of it so there's this very positive very benign version of alcohol out there what i found incredibly useful was to strip away all of that because what alcohol is it it's it's a class one carcinogen it's as in the, the who have placed it the world health organization have placed it in the same carcinogen class as cigarette smoking and asbestos okay strip away all of what's added to it it's it's a foul tasting carcinogen and if you're in any doubt about the taste of it try drinking it on its own neat you know we humans are physically incapable of drinking neat alcohol um it's highly poisonous to us what it actually does to us it it sedates us, so it makes us feel slightly dulled before wearing off, leaving a corresponding feeling of anxiety. So what I'm trying to say here is there's two different versions of alcohol. If you want to continue drinking, you want to buy into the, it's lovely, it's benign, it's very nice, all the rest of it. You want to buy into that version of it. If you want to quit, 
you need to start seeing it differently. Um, and for me, that's the reality of it. It's not everyone's reality of it, but it certainly is my reality of it in that it's not a particularly pleasant thing to do. And I think it's very interesting to compare it with smoking because, like I said, alcohol consumption is tailing off. <clears throat> There's more and more talk about restriction around the advertising of it. It's a very similar trend to 40 years ago that we saw with tobacco. So I think for me and for a lot of other people, it's changing your perception of it. You know, is it the icing on the cake when I'm on vacation or Christmas or is it something quite different? We're coming up on our hour mark. So I want to be, of course, respectful of your time. I could keep you here for hours, <clears throat> but it's a little bit later where you are mm -hmm. in the world. But I want I typically annoy our guests at the end of our podcast with trying to get them to tell us a little bit of information on what you see as as a realistic or your opinions on on what the future holds for us. So you've hinted at, you actually just hinted at this again of, while a lot of cultures, particularly in the quote unquote West, are taking a better look at alcohol and a lot of different cultures are actually deciding it's just not worth it. This is a cultural part of who we are, but it doesn't have to be. So if you had to look at maybe a global context, you could focus maybe more on the UK. What do you see the place of alcohol holding for your country in the next 10 or 20 years? Yeah, I can also confess something I've never <laughs> I've never said before, because usually when I'm talking on podcasts, it's like sobriety podcasts, but I really like pubs. So it, obviously we have really old historic pubs in London and it, I, I hate seeing them close down. And I really enjoy alcohol-free beer. I know a lot of people, when they try and stop drinking, they don't want anything to do with it, but I really do like alcohol-free beer. For me, it's a sort of a, a nice mix between, or like, a you know, water doesn't always do it, but you don't always want a highly sugared soft drink or fruit juice. So for me, an alcohol-free beer is really nice. I see a really positive trend in pubs in that there's more and more alcohol-free beers available. And even on tap now, we get alcohol-free beers. So my hope is that people start to make very different decisions around alcohol. So alcohol consumption goes down, but the breweries don't just cease and the pubs don't close down. They remain an integral part of our society, but that they just start serving a lot more alcohol-free varieties. I do think there will probably be incidents that hasten its demise one of which springs to mind was flying so over here in the uk and it was just before lockdown there was a big focus on people getting drunk at airports getting on airplanes and causing loads of aggravation and it was just about warming up i think to there being a like a limit on how much you know almost like a driving limit but before you fly but then of course lockdown kicked that kicked in and everything was sort of brushed under the carpet but i expect there's going to be more restrictions on advertising possibly more restrictions on sales tax on it seems to be going up but as i say on the positive side the sober movement's growing you know when i first wrote alcohol explained the question was do I have a problem? Am I an alcoholic? If the answer is no, carry on happily. If the answer is yes, then very regrettably quit. Whereas now it's very different and people are quitting much more of like a lifestyle choice. And when they do that, they want alcohol free versions. So, so that's my hope is that we don't see a decline in the industry. We just see it morph into something slightly different. Well, William Porter, Alcohol Explained. Understand why you drink and how to stop and alcohol explain two tools for a stronger sobriety. Yeah. Where is the best way to, to find one or both of your texts if one is so interested in, in reading it? So the um, probably the website, which is alcoholexplained.com and the first five chapters of the first book are on there. So if you're interested, have a look on there and read it um, and see what you think. You also have a, an online course on there as well, I saw. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that, that's basically everything that's in the, both the books, but on a kind of a, like a more an interactive course online thing. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, William, I'd love to do this again. Obviously, I feel like we've only scratched the surface of your first book and you we didn't even really touch on why and how you wrote your second one. So I'd love to speak with you again in the near future if, you'd, if you'd be willing to. And uh, And we really appreciate your time. And thank you so much, William. My pleasure. 
be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all our interviews and beer-related content. Remember, craft beer is here.